Awesome. Thank you for the uh, introduction. That's awesome. How many of you have watched uh, online video today or yesterday? Just a quick show of hands. YouTube or... Yeah. And I'm sure some of you encountered buffering or slow startup. It's super annoying. Um, and we found that it can... It doesn't always have to be that way, but delivering online video is quite challenging. So uh, my name is Scott Kidder. I work at Mux. Uh, I'm going to talk about the real-time anomaly detection system that uh, I've built at MUX using Apache Flink. So a quick introduction about MUX. Uh, so we're a real-time analytics service for video. Uh, we have uh, some pretty well-known customers that include PBS, Funny or Die, IGN, Wistia, and several others. These customers are fairly diverse, so PBS hosts video content that oftentimes mirrors their broadcast content. Funny or Die hosts user-generated content. IGN hosts original on-demand and live-streamed content. And Wistia is an online video platform that uh, processes and hosts third-party content. So the differences might seem pretty subtle, but they have pretty big impacts on the types of errors that can be generated when accessing this kind of video. All of these customers send information to MUX that include buffering metrics, uh, information about uh, startup time, other metrics that represent the end user experience. Our, our service receives information for millions of video views each day. We need to process this data and present it to our customers as quickly as possible so that they can address uh, video delivery issues. So I think we're all familiar with what this represents. It's super annoying, it happens way too often. Playback is stalled or it's slow. Sometimes it's due to problems on the server side. Sometimes it's due to problems on the client side. Sometimes it's somewhere in between due to network issues. In all cases, it's awful. Um, and it's important that the video publisher know about these kinds of problems so they can take action on it and, most importantly, understand what their users are experiencing. A book that's popular among people at MUX is Andy Grove's High Output Management. And this particular statement really resonated with me not just as somebody who's interested in, in uh, developing software and in good business practices, but also as somebody who works with Apache Flink. So all production flows have a basic characteristic, which is that the material becomes more valuable as it moves through the process. So an assembled automobile is more valuable than the, the components themselves. A well-cooked meal is more valuable than the raw uh, inputs that go into that meal. Um, similarly, the stream processing applications that we build with Apache Flink are able to make observations that are more valuable than the raw events that feed those applications. So we asked ourselves, what sort of processing could we do at MUX that would add the most value to all these raw video view events that we're accumulating from our customers? So we considered these questions and more when we were building the MUX uh, analytics service. We wanted to make it possible for video delivery to be just another monitored service. So Susan Fowler's book, Production Ready Microservices, lists the following four attributes of a well-monitored microservice. So you start off with logging, which we already had in the form of video view event logging. So you can see examples of that on the right where you've got playing and pausing. All of these are events associated with a specific video view. Second, you've got dashboards, which we have in the form of a, a really nice web dashboard that presents details about individual video views, as well as aggregate metrics that can be broken down by uh, operating system, browser, geography, and more. What we lacked were support for alerting and an on-call rotation. On-call rotation is something that we could very easily handle with a third-party service like PagerDuty or OpsGenie. That's a solved problem. No need to reinvent the wheel there. What we lacked was support for alerting. That is what introduced us to Apache Flink. We needed something that could implement these very uh, these alerting rules that are very specific to our use case. And so we evaluated different uh, streaming platforms, and Apache Flink really stood out. So the types of, error, uh, types of alerts that we needed to be able to generate were broken down into these two dimensions. So property alerts, uh, we use the term property. You could think of it as a site, a customer site. So a problem affecting an entire customer property. Uh, an example of that might be a CDN outage that indiscriminately affects video playback for numerous video titles uh, over a large area. The second is uh, video title alerts, where 
there might be an exceptionally high error rate for a specific video title. That could be to, due to a video being poorly encoded during processing, or maybe the metadata about that video is incorrect, so when it eventually gets published to the site, uh, end user devices end up trying to play it incorrectly. So technical requirements for our solution. We need a system that could be able to process all, all video views for all of our customer properties and accumulate these error rates for every video title. This is a very large volume of data. It needed to be very low latency to ensure quick notifications to our customers of problems so that they can take action. It needs to be high availability to ensure um, that the failure of one or more services that are part of the, the system uh, can be tolerated. Uh, it also needs to be horizontally scalable to allow for cost-effective and easy scaling. It needs to run in Docker in EC2. So we use Docker to deploy nearly all of our services wherever possible, and we run most of our services on EC2. So um, it would be preferable to have whatever system we chose uh, run in Docker and EC2, and Flink fit both of those requirements. So let's talk about how our application is designed. So our event ingestion architecture begins with a view event source on the left. Uh, so that is a client SDK. So we just we uh, we have libraries for numerous video playback platforms, such as HTML5 and VideoJS on the web, and uh, native libraries for iOS and Android apps. So these native SDKs they relay uh, events related to video playback to our event collectors, and the event collectors do minimal processing on the video events. They simply throw them onto a Kinesis stream. Uh, we use Kinesis for most of our processing. Uh, I know that a lot of people here use Kafka, but uh, for us, Kinesis, for a variety of reasons, happened to work out really well. Um, so the event collectors place messages on a sharded Kinesis stream, which is then uh, feeds into multiple event processors. Uh, so the collectors and the processors, these are all written in Go. These were some of the very first components that we developed at Mux. I think now that knowing what I know about Apache Flink, I probably would have um, proposed that we implement that a little bit differently, but maybe that's going to happen in the future. I don't know. Um, so the event processors, they read from a specific uh, Kinesis shard, and they accumulate all the events that are associated with a single uh, video view. So that includes you know, player load, uh, playback starts, it's paused, it starts again, et cetera. So we accumulate all those events, and once playback either finishes successfully or an error is encountered, then the relevant details for that view are placed on a second Kinesis stream that feeds into our Apache Flink app. So our Flink execution plan, this is just kind of a high-level view of how it works uh, for the purpose of alerting. So we've got a Kinesis stream source that feeds into a Kinesis source. Uh, our messages are encoded as, uh, as protobuf. Uh, we use protobuf encoding for all the messages that we send to Kinesis. Um, so we parse that message, and then we do some initial filtering to exclude uh, views that are coming from web crawlers. So one of the things that we've kind of uh, discovered in the process of building the service is that there are a large number of uh, web crawlers out there that actually trigger video views, which is crazy. But <laughs> um, so we need to exclude those from our measurements. So we do that uh, prior to feeding into these counting windows. So we've got a property-wide counting window that accumulates a fixed number of video views uh, for each property. Uh, once that window is full, it, it then uh, is provided to an error type flat map join or flat map operator that then calculates the error rates for all the different error types that we know to exist for our customer property. One of the um, kind of details about MUX is that each customer has its own set of errors. So they name errors in a way that makes sense for their particular use case, or they have their own set of error types. So um, we need to calculate the error, error rates for each of those error types kind of differently. So the error rates then propagate to a rolling fold operator that compares the currently observed error rate with an accumulated history of earlier observed error rates. So we compare the current observation with uh, what we've seen in the past, and we determine if the current observation is exceptionally high. If it is, then 
that can trigger the opening of an alert, in which case uh, that rolling fold operator calls into the MUX alerting rest, REST API to open an alerting incident. Uh, so long as that incident is open and windows continue to be uh, filled and they, they propagate down to the rolling fold operator, the number of affected views, uh, the number of views that have generated that, that specific type of error will be updated in the incident. So you'll actually see the an increase in the number of, uh, of affected uh, video views in our web dashboard, which I'll show later. It's a similar process for video title alerts, uh, except in this case we accumulate a fixed number of video views for each specific video title. Um, one of the one of the challenges that we faced is that we needed to be able to automatically close alerting incidents after some period of time. So there might be a huge number of, of video views that happen and uh, an alerting incident is opened, but then you might not see any views for that, that video ever again. Uh, so we needed to be able to automatically expire those alerting incidents. So we accomplished that by using processing time timers on the counting windows. So once a, a counting window is open, we set processing time timer that will uh, trigger at a specific number of days in the future, and that will result in a partially full window kind of propagating down downstream and eventually uh, expiring the alert. So another improvement that we made later on was the introduction of a control stream. Uh, so this pipe, the, the pipeline that I just showed you was working great, but we need the, the ability to be able to kind of dump that accumulated state to some offline storage, uh, whether it's S S3 or um, something else. We just need to be able to get that state out of our Flink application. So we introduced a RabbitMQ uh, stream source to our application where we could simply drop a message onto a RabbitMQ queue, have that feed into our application. That goes into a, a, what is now an error type flat map join operator that joins the video view event stream and this uh, control operator, uh, control stream source, uh, source. And then that propagates downstream, instructing all those rolling fold operators to write their state to S3. So this is uh, a great way to kind of give us visibility into what's happening in, with this accumulated state. It also helps us address the, the problem of cold starts. So our application can actually read that um, previously written history from S3 uh, if we're starting it without um, loading from a save point, which is kind of cool. So here's what the, the topology looks like with the introduction of that control stream source. So we've got RabbitMQ in the top left. The field feeds into uh, that control stream source, and then that forwards messages into the flat map join operator, and then it passes on downstream. So deployment and operations concerns. Uh, so all of our services are deployed as doc Docker containers in EC2. Um, there isn't an official Flink Docker image, uh, which was a little bit disconcerting at first, but there's a, there's a Docker file that's provided in the, the Flink source repository that was a really good starting point for us to build our own Docker image. And in the end, we ended up having, having to make kind of customizations or take patches that we have eventually contributed back to Flink. Um, we wanted to deploy those more quickly, so we ended up wanting to make our own builds of Flink anyway. So. Um, so we ended up building our own Flink Docker image. So we use the same uh, Docker image for Flink job managers and task managers. It just runs as a job manager or task manager, depending on the arguments that are supplied to the Docker image when, or the Docker container when it starts up. Uh, and the, when we started to work on this, I was using the Alpine base image for Java, which worked great. Uh, it produced very small uh, Docker images, but uh, Eventually, we had to introduce the ability to send messages to a Kinesis stream, so that added a dependency on the KPL, which is the Kinesis producer library. And the KPL actually bundles in the jar native executables that send messages to Kinesis. And the executables for Linux are linked against glibc, which doesn't work on Alpine, because uh, Alpine uses a different libc. So that forced us to switch to Debian Jesse. So um, it didn't really have much impact on the performance of Flink itself. Uh, Flink worked fine, but it was kind of an unexpected kind of speed bump in the way. Um, 
So builds and behavioral tests. So all of our um, application builds happen in uh, using BuildKite. So BuildKite is an automated build service. Uh, so we build our application jar using BuildKite. Uh, we build our Docker images using BuildKite. And when our Flink application jar is finished building, we actually run a suite of behavioral tests against it. Uh, so we'll actually use Docker and Docker to start up a Flink container with our application jar. And then we have a Docker Compose file that uh, starts up all of our service dependencies, all the touch points for our application. So it starts up a uh, Kinesa Lite uh, Kinesis clone. It starts up MinIO, which is an S3 clone. It starts up RabbitMQ and InfluxDB. And we're then able to interact with our Flink app uh, by dropping messages into Kinesis or into RabbitMQ and then verify the outputs by querying InfluxDB or querying uh, this S3 clone to make sure the files are placed where we, we expect them to be. Um, so this has been very valuable. Uh, there are a lot of time-sensitive kind of attributes to our application that would be very tedious, maybe even impossible to test manually. So being able to test this uh, in an automated way uh, as part of our just natural build process is really valuable. So internal monitoring, we use StatsD to emit uh, Flink metrics about our cluster. We use the built-in StatsD monitor, and it works great. Uh, we run a Telegraph Docker container alongside all of our other Docker containers. Telegraph consumes those StatsD metrics and writes them to InfluxDB. We then have a capacitor uh, instance that is monitoring all these metrics that are being written to Influx, and uh, if there's something about the metrics that indicates the presence of a problem or simply the absence of metrics, uh, Capacitor will alert us via OpsGenie. So how does this look from the perspective of a Mux customer? So this web dashboard, I realize from this perspective, it might be a little difficult to view. But uh, on, the, on the far left, we've got a description of each of the alerting incidents that are, once it's open, uh, as well as, so if it's a video title alert, it indicates the title, uh, as well as a description of the alert. It indicates the, the amount of time that it's been open for, uh, the number of views that have been impacted, which is updated as those counting windows um, complete and are processed by the rolling fold operator. And then we've also got an estimate of the number of views impacted by per hour. So that's actually derived from the amount of time that it took for the counting window to complete. So it kind of indicates the velocity at which views are being affected. Uh, we can send alert notifications to Slack or email. And you can look at individual alert incident details. So it includes a lot of the same information, uh, the, the data-driven threshold that was used to trigger the alert, uh, the duration, the amount of time that's been open for, and we also include uh, a listing of related incidents that match the same fingerprint as the current, currently selected incident. So you can detect the, the presence of a, a pattern. So thank you for allowing me to uh, share how we've used Flink. And uh, I'd love to take questions after the session. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but thank you again. Thank you, Dr. I think we have time for one question if you want. Uh, Yes. Uh, so we've we've okay. Uh, the question was, how do we um, forward messages from the control stream down? Right. So we've got two stream sources: one from Kinesis and one from RabbitMQ. Uh, they're really not that different from each other, um, but we just take the, the those two data streams and we perform a, a join on the flat map. Uh, flat map op operator. It's it, it, exactly well. They don't have to be keyed similarly, but um, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Chris. If you want to have more questions, probably can yeah. stay in the rest of the couple minutes. But uh, we have five minutes transition, and we're gonna have uh, another round. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you.